Groucho Marx once said, I would never want to belong to an organization that would have me as a member. And beneath the sort of obvious deprecating self humor, self-deprecating humor in that there's kind of another layer and we're going to get into that in a little bit but an organization that would have anyone and everyone is stronger when we come together as community we are stronger individually and collectively with all of our differences and imperfections and all of the things that are different about us, it's actually our strength. Well, welcome. Thank you for coming out today to the Center for Spiritual Living here. And if you're watching online, thank you for tuning in. It is indeed an honor. Our monthly theme for December is community. And the title of my talk is Longing to Belong. I think that there is something that is within each and every one of us that is called to belong, to connect with other human beings. My three major points today, I'm going to talk about how God, Spirit, the thing itself, the universe, however you refer to or connect with a higher power, that that thing is always helping us grow. And I might add, it cares a lot more about our growth than it does our comfort. My second point is that this is a time of year when I think the veil is thin, when we are so close. As we come together in community, it's when we get so close to that touch point. And my third point is that there is one block to that coming together as community and I think Groucho Marx really unveiled it. I would never want to belong to an organization that would have me as a member almost indicates that I don't feel worthy of being in that community. So the divine creative force of the universe is always helping us grow. Tell a story of second chances. All of my stories today come from uh, this month's Guidepost magazine. If you do not get that, I would recommend it. It's a great uh, little magazine. It's switched now to six times a year. They do it every other month. So this month is December, January. But it's a great magazine, and, and all of my stories come from that. This is called The God of Second Chances. A guy by the name of Monty Gannon is a pastor of a small church in Omaha, Nebraska. And Monty has a, uh, a past. Monty uh, got into drugs when he was young. I think he was 14 when he started doing meth. Um, he had a rough go in life. And he was very, very fortunate in that um, he had met a gal and they, they had got along. He was able to hide his addiction. He started off by maybe only using a little meth on the weekends. Uh, then it got to be maybe once during a week and then it got down to every day and it finally got to the place where Monty was walking around high all of the time. Uh, and he was able to keep that hidden until the train came off the tracks and he ended up losing his job and you know, it, all kinds of different problems uh, you can imagine came into his life. But he was able to see through that and he worked through that and he came uh, to an organization, I don't know, I don't think it was a center for spiritual living, but it was a place where he had the ability to connect to his higher power and he was able to see through that and get into recovery after a few painful relapses. He was able to get into recovery and he actually uh, became the pastor of this small church in Omaha, Nebraska. It started out, uh, the larger church that he initially attended sent him out to sort of spread the word and he ended up in Omaha having meetings in his uh, living room and uh, that expanded and they were uh, then renting a hotel uh, uh, ballroom for their Sunday services um, 
with the dreaded uh, church in a box where all of the music instruments, all of the things are in a trailer. Uh, they have to store it, drag it there every week. Um, and they were in that phase of church in a box when thieves stole their trailer. And they found their trailer across the state line in the next uh, state, actually in Indiana, and <clears throat> totally burned to the ground. And everything was lost. Um, due to some very good police work, uh, the uh, culprits were apprehended. But this story... God of Second Chances has a parallel. And this is from a Michael Smith. And Michael Smith also faced addiction at a very young age. I think he was 12 when he first started getting into drugs. And his outcome was not quite the same. Uh, he grew up tough. He dropped out of high school. He fought, he kicked, he stole. He did whatever it took to survive, which meant getting more and more money to feed his addictions. And it told, talks about how they spotted this trailer. They figured there must be some, uh, something very valuable in it. And so they stole the trailer, went across the state line, broke into it and found a bunch of music instruments and stuff. They didn't really know what they could do with that. They knew it would be hard to fence it. So they took the things that they could, and in order to cover their tracks and fingerprints, they torched the trailer and left. Well, you can figure out that the trailer that they stole was that one for the little church of Monty Gannon's uh, church. Where I'm going with this long story is that in his Sunday message, after everything had been stolen and they were trying to patch things together to put together a Sunday service. Pastor Gannon Monty said the following. If you are the person who did this, I want you to know that God loves you. You are valuable. And we have a place for you at our church. You are invited and we want to help you. The story continues in guideposts with uh, Michael being in, in prison and getting a visitor. And the visitor happens to be Monty Gannon. And he repeats that invitation and he talks about forgiveness. And this so shook Michael Smith that he was totally surprised when he was released. The church didn't press charges against him. And even though he had a very checkered past, he was released. And he started attending this small church. Ernest Holmes, in Living the Science of Mind, wrote, What would happen if we could convert the energy of fear to faith? The energy of doubt and uncertainty into a feeling of belonging to the universe and being safe in it. Would not the original artist itself go forth into new creation through us? If we could just step out of the fear, if we could step out of the energy of doubt and uncertainty and step into a feeling of belonging. I do believe that that infinite creative force would continue to pour through us into greater and greater creation. My second point, this is the time of year. And it's not only Christians that celebrate this time of year. Many, many, many faith traditions honor this particular time of year, from the Wiccans to just about every faith tradition you can think of, even the Buddhists, in Japan, the, the Japanese version of, of Buddhism has a ritual where they decorate a bonsai tree with uh, beads and uh, very, very similar to what we do with Christmas trees and whatnot. And in it, some of the principles are the same. It's the very things that we have on our walls. Joy, light, peace, love. The things that we embrace 
in our philosophy and it's tr true throughout Christ Christianity and many other faith traditions. One of the greatest teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, as well as common to many other faith traditions, is stated in, in what Jesus called, uh, or what he stated is, it is done unto you as you believe. Um, I've talked about this numerous times um, and, and the meaning of that and how it goes, but we can boil that down into the thought that our thoughts are creative. Our thoughts and feelings are creative. And it, as we think is what it has done unto us. It's what we come back with. What we put out into the universe is returned. It's a mirror. Another story, this is the angel in hiding. A lady by the name of Jeannie Hughes in Hurricane, West Virginia, tells the story. Her family has a, a tradition, and it really sounds like a great tradition uh, for the family. They celebrate Christmas and everything just about like everybody else, but on New Year's Day, they have a thing they call it undecorate day, and they take down all of the decorations and they lovingly put away every ornament everything that they have all the boughs and the ribbons and things they take them down and carefully put them away and they remember the the warmth of the season they remember all of the wonderful experiences of the the christmas day undecorating day well one year there was a terrible, terrible tragedy in Jeannie Hughes' family. Her son, Stephen, was killed uh, right after Christmas and before New Year's on Decorating Day. Uh, he was on his way into work and hit an unknown, unseen black ice patch, went off the road and over a cliff, and he was killed instantly. And Jeannie was was devastated, understandably. And on New Year's Day, when it came time for undecorating, she just didn't have it in her heart. And so all of the Christmas decorations stayed up. And she would look at it and just didn't have it in her. And it got to be February, and her husband said, you know, would you like to take down the decorations, and she snapped, no, and I don't want to hear about it anymore. But a, a little while later, she realized that she, she needed to do this and to move on. She felt by doing this and that she'd be moving on, that she'd be forgetting her son, Stephen, that she'd be somehow disconnecting. But she started to do it anyway, and she thought, well, before I take everything down, I'll turn on the lights on the tree one last time, and so she had to get down on all fours and find the cord and get it over to plug it in, and as she was under there plugging in the lights one last time, she looked over, and something caught her eye, and it was an ornament she had never seen before, and she didn't know what it was. She reached over, and she grabbed it, and there was this little figure. It was a little, um, they could call it a cherub. It was a uh, little round baby, uh, had, and it was holding a golden heart. It had a little halo and everything, and it was on the top of a little ceramic Christmas tree. And she said, well, ah, where did that come? I don't know what that is. And she turned it around to look at it further, and she looked down, and there was a card attached, and it said, to mom, Merry Christmas, love Stephen. And Stephen knew that she would find that on, on decorating day. And rather than being hurt by that, she felt Stephen's love through time and space. And as she took every ornament off, her pain got less and less, and her love grew more and more. And she realized 
that yes, he may be gone, but Stephen's love will always be with her. Her attitude changed. Her attitude went from expecting pain and hurt to an attitude of acceptance and love and peace and joy and light. It is done unto you as you believe. Third point, this block that we have into stepping into a role of community and this idea that we are not worthy. Once again, the story comes from guideposts. Uh, it's called Wonderfully Made. Uh, a high school teacher uh, teaches uh, Spanish by the name of Tabitha Williams in Middletown, Delaware told a story, uh, starts actually a few years ago. Uh, she noticed that um, she was losing little tiny spots of hair. They were little tiny things about the head of a pin and she was had lost several of them. And so she was concerned. She went to the dermatologist. Dermatologist looked it all over and said, I don't think it's anything, but if the spots get bigger, you start losing more, come back and we'll look into it. Well, the spots got bigger, and pretty soon they were the size of dimes. And um, she was very concerned, and she went back to the doctor. They went to a specialist who ran tests. They talked about her diet, and they talked about the stress at work and all of the other things that might influence it. Uh, and finally, the doctor came back with a diagnosis. She had alopecia. Areata. And this is a condition in which a person loses their hair. And it goes from a, a mild case that somebody gets and they might lose a little bit of their hair. And then it comes back all the way up through the extreme case of person loses all their hair and it's gone forever. And um, she was really devastated by this. And just about that time, she discovered that she was pregnant. And she was able to blame part of this, her hair loss on the hormones and changes of being pregnant. Uh, but after she had the baby and it got to be time she had to go back to school, she got more and more nervous. So she put on a scarf, a headscarf, and she wore the headscarf for the rest of the year. And she hid her baldness. And as the summer progressed, all the rest of her hair was completely gone and she was faced with going back to school. And she sat with it and she came to the conclusion that she needed to be open and transparent with her students. That the way that she connected so well with all of her students was by being open and transparent. And so she took all of her courage, but she showed up for class that first day of the next year. And she took off her scarf before she walked into school. She walked in totally bald. And there were some double takes, particularly among the staff. Uh, but the kids would look up and uh, look back. But when she got into her classroom, she told the kids, I have this condition, I am healthy, I am strong, and she did it in Spanish. It's a great story, you ought to get guideposts and read it. And, um, and she told them that she, it, this, this condition, and all it is means is that I don't have hair. But other than that, I'm perfectly healthy, and my baby's wonderful, and all is well. And the attitude to the kids was just awesome. Uh, the kids like, oh, okay. But what they were really interested in is what they're having for lunch or who's dating who or who's going out, who's doing what. It was good to know, but it was forgotten in minutes. And then a student came in, former student, who had always worn a uh, headband. And she just thought it was the style of the time. She thought it was fine. And this student had the headband came in and this is what she said. I've been afraid to tell anyone 
that I had alopecia. But seeing you today, hear how upfront you are being. It has given me the courage to share my secret. And she pulled off her headband and she was totally bald. This thing that we call God, spirit, the thing itself, however we refer to that infinite creative force, could care less about the number of hairs on our head than it does about what's going on inside of our head and inside of our heart, just like her, her kids in her school. They cared more about what she thought and what she felt than what she had on her head. One of her therapists, one of the people that she worked with, made the comment, uh, how did she say it? Girl, you rock the ball. <laughs> and I think we've got a picture of um, uh, Tabitha. There, there is Tabitha Williams. Um, and I, indeed, she rocks the ball. That smile, I think, uh, says it all. That infinite creative force that is expressing through us doesn't care about that. But her ability to be open and honest and transparent in front of her students gave them the inspiration, gave them permission to be the same way. What a gift Tabitha Williams is. What a gift at this time of year. My conclusion, so I can, everybody can get out of here and get home and start shoveling again. <laughs> I would never want to belong to an organization that would have me as a member. Science of mind calls for us to recognize wholeness, spirit itself, expressing through all things, the good things, the bad things, the challenges, it is here, it is to be known. If there is no separation, then the only real separation is my ego self-creating that illusion. The science of mind is the compassionate, practical application of seeking to see that wholeness through all experiences, including the expressions of humanity itself. I want to go back to the inspirational quote. We envision a world in which we live and grow as one global family that respects and honors the interconnectedness of all life. A world where this kinship with all life prospers and connects through the guidance of spiritual wisdom and experience. We live and grow as one global family. And so with this feeling of oneness, this feeling of coming together as part of a larger global family, I invite my colleagues, the practitioners, to join me in surrounding our congregation, our city, our state, our nation, the entire globe in a healing consciousness of love, of peace, of joy, of light, of harmony. We simply recognize that that infinite creative force is always conspiring to help us. And it will help us to the degree that we allow it to. We just affirm that we are open to all the guidance, the inspiration of that infinite creative force. We are open to doing our part and working with the co-creation that is spirit, that is creation itself. And so as we go through this thing called life and we have all of the ups and downs and ins and outs and the things that appear to be disastrous and the things that are disastrous, we know that that infinite creative force is there with us 
So for those of us who are at this time experiencing health issues, we simply know that there is a power that created everything, including this disease, and that there is a way that is above and out and through this situation. I speak my word for those who are experiencing lack and limitation, feeling that there is not enough, there is less paycheck than there is month. We simply know that we live in an abundant universe and as we open ourselves up, that ever greater expanse of the universe will flow into our existence. And I speak my word for those who are feeling separation, separation from one another and separation from God. We just simply know that it is impossible for us to be separate because we are one. We are one in God, we are one in spirit, we are one in that infinite creative force. We are brothers and sisters. And I speak my word now for those who broke into our center. We just simply know, for to those of you who did this, we want you to know that that infinite creative force loves you just as you are. You are valuable and we have a place for you at this very center and you are invited. We want to help you, we want to be with you, we want to extend our love to you. And so we just give thanks. We give thanks for our awareness of the power and the presence of the infinite that is with us. So we just give thanks, we let it go, we let it be, and so it is.